all stand. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my soul. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my chose me it's always been a mystery all my life I've been told I belong at the end of the line with all the other not quite with all that never get it right but it turns out we're the ones you were looking for all this time so I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody Ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. 
happy time, sad time. Be thankful because there's a purpose in it. And God is going to bring you joy. He's going to bring you peace. And he is going to provide for each and every need that is here this morning. Let's pray. Father God, we bow before you this morning with nothing but thankful hearts. We are so thankful, God, that you, we live in a country that you can, that you can, Father, that you can just give us the freedom to come and to worship your name. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for all these people that are here this morning. I pray that you would forgive me of my many sins and shortcomings. Father, I ask you to bless those that are watching on Facebook this morning and those that are here in the sanctuary. And help us, Lord, to be the shining light that you would have us to be. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Y'all may be seated. praise band they, they are back they are back yeah I know you're back I can't do anything with that young and bless his heart oh it's good to see you today I got some papers here somewhere I see I got a card I want to read to you um uh, Thank you for the generous gifts and for thinking of me on my graduation day. Your support is appreciated on this memorable occasion. That's from Joyce Hyatt. Uh, Tina, tell Joyce we love her. We appreciate her so much, and we're praying for her daily. 
Uh, let's see, a couple of announcements I want to give to you. Uh, Adam and Haley, oh, here they are. They're, they got married. Yeah. Who'd, have, who'd have thought that? Uh, well, they, they are having a wedding shower today from 2 to 4. It is a drop-in down at the uh, lower building. Is there going to be cake? Cake? I'm coming. Cake. <laughs> Hi. Right. Uh, so if you'd like to join in on that, please do. Uh, golf tournament is Saturday, July 25th. This is the biggest fundraiser we do for the church all year. All the funds go to the building fund. It's very awesome. It's a good thing. Uh, we need players. If you are a player or know of one, please let me know. We need whole sponsors, okay? Uh, again, if you'd like, if your business or you personally, your organization would like to sponsor a whole, please let me know about that. We also need Gatorades and waters for our players. I see some people already started bringing those in, so please continue to do that. Uh, let's see, what else do we need? Um, something else. Is there anything else? Gift cards, yeah, thank you. We need gift, thank you. You do that, Linda? Look at you, girl. Yeah, thank you. Reading my mind. Uh, we do need gift cards. So uh, if you next time you're out at the store, your favorite restaurant, Walmart, grocery store, whatever, pick up a gift card. All of our golfers get prizes. It's a it's a very cool thing to do. Uh, the biggest thing you can do is show up and help and pray. Okay, pray for that event, and it will be blessed. Okay, uh, a few names that I want to mention to you for prayer. Uh, Irene Haynes, continue to pray for Miss Irene. She's at Hendersonville Health and Rehab. Uh, her daughter uh, sent me a message the other day, uh, her daughter Peggy, and said, Miss Irene has been diagnosed with COVID. Uh, she's doing fine. In fact, she didn't even really show any of the symptoms, but, but she has it. But continue to pray for Miss Irene. Jeff Lauder, he's going to Baptist Hospital in Wake Forest this Tuesday. Be praying for him. Diane Merrill has a major procedure coming up. Uh, Donnie Hoots, I saw Donnie here. There he is. Got the shingles, brother. Bless your heart. Been there, done that. How you doing today? Do, doing okay. All right. Still praying for you? Yeah. Uh, Kelly Elliott. Some of you remember Dean Elliott, who was the pastor here before me about 20 years ago. His older daughter, Kelly, has a, was it a, was it a tumor, Tim? A tumor in her intestine they're talking to oncologists all of that please be praying for Kelly Elliott if you would please uh, some of you are wondering why I'm dressed up for this service I'm going to a funeral when I get finished here we've been praying for a young man he's 20 years old uh, he had uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma he passed away this past week Marcus McGee would you be praying for his family please, uh, Shane and Becky, they, they really need our prayers today. Funerals at two, be lifting them up. And let's see, last but not least on my list by any means is Miss Ariel. She's having a couple procedures later this month. Please be praying for Ariel Carson, if you would, please. How about an unspoken request? I have many. If you're able, stand, let's pray together. Lord Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the privilege of being in church. We thank you for the privilege of listening to music that is for you and being able to praise you and lift a holy hand toward heaven, Lord Father. We thank you for that. Lord, let us not ever, ever take what we have for granted. We thank you that we live in a country where we can still worship you freely Lord Father I pray for every person that I've named every person in this building I lift them up to you and their family Lord there's not a person in here that doesn't need you today Father some of us are worried some of us are hurting some of us are sick some of us love someone who's sick Someone in here is facing something uncertain. And Lord, Father, we just need you. We need you, Father. Lord, for those that have procedures upcoming, we pray that you would help them. For those who have lost loved ones, we pray that you would hold them up. And Lord, Father, we do pray for our nation. We need you so desperately. Father, we don't pray just for us. We pray for our world. 
Our world needs you, Father. Lord, please show yourself mighty. Pray that you just cover this planet with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I come back to this little church and I pray, Lord God, that your hand would be upon it. That you would bless us individually and collectively. Please help us, Father. Lord, we love you. We thank you again for letting us be here to be together. It's in Jesus' name that we do pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Please remain standing. Amen. This is one of my favorite songs. You know, that my fear doesn't stand a chance. Your fear doesn't stand a chance if you know Jesus. Amen. So y'all sing with us. Darkness tries to roll over my bone. Sorrow comes to steal the joy out. Brokenness and pain is all I know. I won't be shaken. I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing your love. place to hide I am not captive to the night I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love
Man, I feel like we're having church again. It's been too long. Gosh, this is good. This is good. You're saying, why are you leaving then, preacher? I'm looking for something. If it's so good, why are you leaving? I, I need this. Can, can, you, can you feel God? Any, James, I know you could. I could see it in your face, brother. I could see it behind that microphone. You were grinning. Golly, just, hey, it, it's, it's, it's good. It's good to worship. It's good to praise God. And, and uh, if you're afraid to get your worship on, as the young folks say, get over it. Amen? Get over it. I'm going to jump right into this. Go to the book of Psalms. Psalm, Psalm chapter 9. I want you to go there with me. Psalm chapter 9. This is a message that I wanted to preach last week, but the Lord wouldn't let me. He said, save it. Save it for this week. So if you weren't here last week, there's a good chance this is for you. Okay? I think it's for all of us, but, but maybe God wanted me to wait till you got here. Psalm 9. As soon as I get there, I'll start reading. Psalm 9. I'm going to jump around a little bit, okay? I'm going to start at verse 1. The psalmist writes, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. Let me put, take it out of King James for you. He's saying, I'm going to praise God wherever I go, and I'm going to tell everybody how wonderful he is and what he does in my life. Okay, verse 2, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. I'm going to jump down to verse 7. But the Lord shall endure forever. God never goes away. He hath prepared his throne for judgment. Everybody say judgment. God is a good God. God is a gracious God. God is a loving God. But there's coming a day of what you just said. Judgment. And he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. I'm going to go down to verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell. And all the nations that forget God. Is it possible that nations forget God? Hmm. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. The psalmist is saying... Lord, there's a lot of nations around the world who think they're all that, all powerful. Nothing can bring them down, but you remind them that they are all just men. Last week, if my math is correct, we celebrated the 244th birthday of the United States of America. 244 years. A nation that I believe, having done lots of research on the subject, was formed and framed on Christian principles. Amen? A nation that has been amazingly blessed and favored by God. Let me stop right there and tell you this. This is not a typical message from Pastor Brian. This is more of a teaching than it is a preaching. There will be no jokes today. So when I say it's more of a teaching than it is a preaching, that means you need to brace yourself up because some of you are going to go to sleep. Okay? I'm going to give you a lot of scripture. I'm going to give you a lot of information. But if you will listen, it will change the way you look at your world today. Okay? Not that I'm doing it, but God's going to help you see something here. Okay? 
We're a nation that has been amazingly favored and blessed by God. And I think most of us would agree, however, that this is no longer a Christian nation. I regret to say that. There are lots of Christians in America, but we are not a Christian nation anymore. If you doubt that, turn on the news, turn on your entertainment, go to the internet, just look and listen, and you will see that we are becoming more and more and more secular all the time. Each generation gets further and further and further away from God. In fact, I fear that as a nation, we have addressed God, turned our backs to Him, and said, in essence, you're not welcome here. We don't need you anymore. We're the United States of America. We're the biggest, baddest player in town. Is that too hard? Am I being too harsh? As I thought about that this past week, or a couple of weeks, I wondered, since our nation has gotten further and further and further away from God, what is America's future? What's going to happen to us? What does, what does God tell us in the Bible about the United States of America? The title of my message is simple. What happens to America? What happens to America? I can see what has happened. And I can see what is happening. And quite frankly, what is happening is very frightening to me. Anybody with me? Very frightening. I can see what was. I can see what is. But what's going to happen? Where are we headed? Where are we going? And so that led me to this question. A very obvious question. Is America mentioned in the Bible or in Bible prophecy? What do you think? Is it? Is it not? Well, we can debate this. Some people say, yes, it is. Some people say it isn't. Well, the short and simple answer this morning, folks, is no. No, it's not. And again, we can debate this, okay? If you don't believe what I'm saying, then th that, that's fine. We can debate it. We can argue it. Th th we're, not, we're not debating the Trinity here or the virgin birth. It's okay. We can disagree to agree to disagree, and we still get to go to heaven. Amen? But based on the research I've done, and, and I do have to point out two theologians that, that, that I've leaned on a lot over, not just for this message, but over the years, Dr. David Jeremiah, maybe you've heard of him, and Mark Hitchcock with Dallas uh, Seminary. I don't think, think America is in the Bible. Even if you disagree with that, you do have to agree that the words America or United States or United Country, or that's not in the Bible. Nothing like that's in there. Now some will argue, well, America is in the Bible symbolically. There are symbols that, that point out America. So I took that into consideration, and I started looking. I Googled all of this stuff. You know, where do people get their, their notion that America is symbolically mentioned in the Bible? There's lots of them, but I picked out two of the main ones that people use to believe that America is mentioned in Bible prophecy. I've had uh, Brian put this up on the screen for us. I want to start out in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. I want to read verse 2. Starting at verse 2. Daniel spake and said... I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove up against the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse, different, one from another. He's going to tell us about four nations that he sees in prophecy. Okay? The first was like a lion. A lion. What country is represented by a lion? Great Britain. Great Britain, and had eagle's wings. Eagle, that must be America. There's a lot of people that whenever they see the word eagle in prophecy, they go, there we are, there we are, there we are, listen, listen. 
Let's see what God has to say. That's our symbol, the eagle. And that would almost make sense here. Here was a lion, and it had eagle's wings. Britain gave birth to America. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Don't, don't let me lose you yet, because this gets better. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth, and made stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Okay, that's the first nation, the lion. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a what? A bear. Who could? Russia? Russia? Yeah. And it raised up itself on one side and had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said... Thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard. You have to study a little bit of history to get this one. Who would the leopard represent, according to people who believe this is America? Who would the leopard represent? Anybody want to guess? Germany. Good guess, though. Germany. Germany, okay? If you look back through German history, look, look into uh, World War II. You'll see the leopard a lot representing Germany. Which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast also had four heads, and the dominion was given to it. Verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible. This is the worst of all. And strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it and it was diverse from all the other beasts it was different from the other beasts that were before it and it had ten horns some people who believe in this particular thing say the ten horns represent a European Union a coalition okay all right, well, well he, here's, here's the problem with that. In seminary, they teach you something called pericope. Pericope is a fancy word that means you got to read what, bef what comes before what you just read and after what you just read. We can't just pick out a verse and go with that. You've got to see what led up to it and what happened after it. If you read Daniel and go through it, you will actually see that the lion represents the Babylonian Empire. The bear represents the Persian Empire. The leopard, the Greek Empire. And the worst of all, the ten-horned beast was the Roman Empire. In fact, look at it this way. Even if this did represent America, the eagle's wings were still out. They were plucked off and thrown away. So that kind of ruins that one, doesn't it? So I had to kick that one aside. Another big one that people choose to use and say that uh, America is in Bible prophecy is in Revelation. I want to go to Revelation 18. Again, Brian will have these up here. I'm going to be skipping around a little bit, okay? So you just follow along on the, on the screen. Uh, Revelation 18, verse 1. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. I read that and I thought, that is the United States of America right there. That's us. And folks, I love my country. But I know the truth. I know what I see. I know what's happening. We, we, we are a habitation of devils. And we do hold every foul spirit. And we have become a, clay, a cage of every unclean bird there is in the world. So a lot of people say, whenever you see Babylon the Great, that's America. Well, let's keep reading. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. That could be us still. 
the world depends upon us a lot. We've, we, we make nations rich. You deal with us, you trade with us, we're going to make you rich. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto the heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Ooh, that could still be us. Verse 8. Therefore... Shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament her, for when they see shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city... Uh-oh. Houston, we have a problem. Great city. Great city Babylon. That mighty city. They're not calling it a nation. For in one hour is thy judgment come. Down to verse 17. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught, and every shipmaster, and all the company and ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea stood afar off, and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Some people read that and say, Okay, preacher, there you go. That's New York City on 9-11. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour she is made desolate. I have been to New York City three, three times since 9-11. It's still there. It didn't burn up in one hour. It's still there. So this is not talking about New York City. Folks, it's not talking about America. Theologians believe that this actually could be talking about the literal Babylon. See, Babylon is still ex in existence in Iraq. It's still there. Now, it's down. It's almost in ruins, or pretty much is in ruins. Saddam Hussein tried to bring it back, but some American soldiers decided that wasn't going to happen. But that doesn't mean it can't happen again. But most theologians believe this is probably talking about Rome. Folks, let me tell you something. Rome plays a big part in how everything ends. What comes out of Rome? Catholic Church. Catholic Church, yeah. And we could talk about the Antichrist a little bit. I won't this morning, but uh, I, I will say this. You, you know, every president has been the Antichrist for the last 45 years, right? <laughs> right? Uh, if we read prophecy and really look at it, I don't think the Antichrist is coming from America. If I was putting my prophetic money on it, uh, it's, it's Rome or the Middle East. Now, folks, here's my point. I love my country, and despite all the problems that we have, I still think this is the greatest nation on earth. So it's hard for me personally to accept the fact that something happens to bring our great nation, our superpower, down. I mean, as I read the Bible and I study prophecy, I see where other countries are mentioned. In Ezekiel, he talks in prophecy about the nation of Rosh. You know who Rosh is? Russia. Russia is mentioned. China is mentioned. India is mentioned. Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. Lebanon. Do, do, you get, do, you get, do you see what I'm saying? It's mainly Middle East centric. 
but there's no America. In fact, there's no North American or South American continent or country in those continents mentioned. And I know some people are saying, well, preacher, maybe America just isn't mentioned. A lot of countries aren't mentioned. I mean, Mexico isn't mentioned. Canada is not mentioned. Argentina is not mentioned. Folks, listen to this. If America continued to be what America is, the most powerful nation on the earth till the end, you would think God would mention it. But he does not. So obviously something happens, which obviously brings us to the title question of this sermon. What happens to America? What happens to America? Well, there are a couple of possibilities. Uh, we could simply just kind of fade away, lose our power, our influence. We could become just, quote, unquote, another country in some newly formed coalition or something, or Something dramatic, catastrophic, traumatic could happen that wipes us out completely. And I know there's people sitting here, they going, that'll never happen, preacher. There's a lot of nations that are gone that thought that same thing. Let me get a little more specific with you. I want to give you four plausible scenarios. Four plausible scenarios of what could, I'm not saying this is going to because I, I don't have the gift, gift of prophecy. I'm telling you this is what could happen to America. See if any of this makes sense. Number one, there could be an economic collapse. There could be an economic collapse. Does anybody know what the American debt is right now? Trillions. Anybody th throw me out a number? 13 trillion. 15 trillion. As of one day last week, I can't remember which day I looked it up, the debt that we owe to other countries, our debt to other countries is $26.5 trillion. Folks, we can't even <laughs> we can't even begin to think about that. Bill Gates looks at $26.5 trillion and goes, my goodness. Okay? The richest Arab sheiks look at that and go, oh, well, I'm glad I don't have that kind of debt. One day, it is possible that someone will call this in. Hey, America, it's time to pay up. We've carried you long enough. And this debt bomb that we're sitting on will implode. And we could simply, let me put it in, in, in common everyday terms. America could be repossessed. Some say China could call in the market and go, oh, you can't pay? We own you. We own you. In two generations, we could be speaking Chinese. We could be incorporated into a one-world money system. They could say, your dollar's no good anymore. You've got to use our currency. I think that's biblical, y'all. It's possible. Is it hot in here to anybody? It's warm to me, too. I'm going to get rid of this if that's okay. We live, let me preach to you just a minute. We live in an entitlement nation. Do you agree with that? And I'm not trying to get political. I, I'm not here Democrat, Republican. I don't want to get into that today. But you have to agree our nation is a nation of entitlements. Every day more and more people decide I'm not going to work anymore. I don't have to because the government will pay my way. Am I telling the truth? Okay? All right. I'm going to rely on the government to provide for me. Listen, we've had this virus thing going on. People have lost their jobs. The government is paying them. A lot of people, I'm not making this up. This is on the news. People are going, I'm good. 
I'm not going back to work. Why? Because Uncle Sam will send me a check. Beloved, one of these days, the people who are working will be less than the people who are taking, and this thing explodes. It falls apart. Are you with me? Economic collapse. Wait till the day, and I hope none of us are here. Wait till the day when Social Security is broke. It's coming. Wait till the day when the entitlements have to stop because there's not enough people producing tax money for the takers to get it. Turn on your news then. You're going to see, you think the riots are bad now? Wait till the checks quit coming in the mail. It's going to get bad. Economic collapse. Listen to this church. This blew me away. Actually, it scared me a little bit because it's talking about us even though it was written over 200 years ago. Okay, Brian's going to put it up on the screen for us. This was written in 1787 by a professor from Scotland. He was an economic professor. His name is Alexander Teitler, T-Y-T-L-E-R, Feel free to look it up, Google it, okay? He was an a prof economic professor at the University of Edinburgh, and his job was to study cultures before 1787, their economics, how they did it, how they worked, how they didn't work, all that. Okay, you got me? You with me? You understand what I'm saying? What this guy's job is? Here's what he wrote in 1787. This is, wasn't in the Wall Street Journal last week. This was centuries ago. He said, a democracy is always temporary in nature. I read that first thing and I was mad. I was like, uh-uh. No, 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 sir, professor. He said, it simply cannot exist as a permanent form of government. A democracy will continue to exist. Oh, listen to this. Will continue to exist up until the time that voters discover that they can vote themselves generous gifts from the public treasury. We don't do that, do we? Yes, we do. We don't vote for the person with the best morals. We don't vote for the Christian. We don't vote for the person who's going to do the right thing. We vote for the person who's going to put the most money in our pockets. You can look at me like i got three heads, but I'm telling the truth. That's what we... Which one of these guys or gals is going to help my business the most? Which one's going to keep my check coming? That's how we vote. If Americans voted for morality, the right thing, biblical principles, we wouldn't be in the hell hole we're in right now. I'm sorry, I just had to say it. But we, we vote with our pocketbooks. From that moment on, the majority always votes for the candidates who promise the most benefits from the public treasury. I think I just said that. With the result that every democracy will finally collapse due to loose fiscal policy. Man, that sounds like us. Which is always followed by a dictatorship. Let's keep reading. The average age of the world's greatest civiliz civilizations from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. We're 244. Ooh. Are we on borrowed time? During those 200 years, these nations always progressed through the following sequence. This blows my mind. From bondage to spiritual faith. Why did our forefathers leave England? So they could worship the way they wanted to worship. It wasn't all about taxes. It wasn't all about... It was mainly so that we could have freedom of worship the way we wanted to. We did not like the Church of England we wanted to be ourselves. We wanted to worship the true God. So we left. 
So we went from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage. We got so much faith in us back then in the 1700s, we took on the most powerful nation on earth, the nation we just left, England. They were the biggest, baddest in town, Greg, back in them days. So we went from faith to great courage, from courage to liberty. We won. We got our freedom. We had liberty. We could do whatever we wanted to do, from liberty to abundance. God blessed us. The land of plenty. It's all right here. From abundance to selfishness. From selfishness to complacency. From complacency to apathy. From apathy to dependence. I'm going to let the government keep me up. From dependence back into bondage. If that doesn't frighten you, folks, you didn't read it. So the first scenario of our demise could be an economic collapse. Second scenario, there could be a defense collapse, a defense collapse. From what I understand, we have the most powerful military on the planet. Is that what you understand? It's my understanding, too. But let me ask you this. Do we really know? Who knows what China has? They didn't tell us about a virus. They ain't going to tell us about atomic weapons. Who knows what Russia has? They're not telling anybody. Are we really the strongest? And if we are, could that change? There could be a nationwide terror attack. And I know you're going, that, no, preacher, you're, 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 that just won't happen. We've got missiles and bases all around the world that are protecting us all the time, and that does make me sleep a little better at night. But how come two or three airplanes got into buildings in New York City without anybody knowing about it? How'd that happen? How'd that happen? If it can happen on a small scale, I imagine it can happen on a big scale with enough planning. What about a nuclear 9-11? Every major city in America hit. We're, we're done. There could be a foreign military takeover. Okay, if you don't buy that, that's cool. I don't like the idea of that. Let me tell you this. The collapse could come from inside. It could come from inside. A new poll came out this week among American voters. And uh, I, I got this information from Ken Ham's blog. If you know who Ken Ham is, Creation Museum and all that, this is a smart man. I trust the stuff he puts out. He said in a, this, this past week, in a new poll, 34% of Americans say a racial, violent civil war in America in the next five years is very possible if things don't turn around. Anybody watch the news lately? Is it possible? After the first service, a man came up to me. And he said, Brian, you're too young to remember this. But he said, when I was a young boy, he said, Nikita Khrushchev. He said, America, I think he was Russian leader at that time. He said, America will destroy itself from the inside. From the inside. They will destroy us from the inside. He said, we'll, we'll never even have to fire a shot. We'll destroy you from the inside. Okay, then let's go there. Let's go there. Let's say it's not a foreign bomb or it's not a civil war between a us and them. And folks, when, when a nation becomes us and them, we're in trouble. And folks, hey, tell you, but we're already there. We are a us and them. Politically, racially, we're, we're us and them now. Even in the church, we're an us and a them between denominations. Our society is an us and a them. You're either for them or you're for us. Here's where I'm headed with this, this collapse from within. The last five months have been pretty interesting, hasn't it? 
What caused all of this? I mean, businesses have been closed. Some will never reopen. And I'm not talking little mom and pop businesses. I'm talking big, big businesses. Not opening up anymore. People have lost jobs, some for good. The economy was, and still may be, we don't know, in jeopardy. Americans are divided. Why? Because of a little virus. Now, don't be mad at me. Well, preacher, you're not taking the virus seriously. Yes, I am. I understand. People are dying. I get it. So don't send me a nasty text or yell at me on your way out. You need to take this more seriously. I'm taking it very serious. I got you. Okay? My point is, this is a something that has like a 1% death rate. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the flu has about the same, the common flu. But this thing shut us down. Let me say it again. I'm not demeaning it. I'm not saying it doesn't matter, okay? Because people get real hostile. See, we're divided even over the virus. We have masked people versus non-masked people. Let's all go in the parking lot and fight. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Now, come on. Okay, now here's my point. Is it possible that America's enemies, and yes, we do have enemies around the world. Is it possible that the enemies of us have been watching this, and you know they have, and going, hmm, boy, that really messed them up. What would happen? What would happen? What would it take? To totally cripple them. Not a lot more. Not a lot more. Somebody somewhere in an enemy nation is thinking right now. A virus almost collapsed their economy. If we just introduced the right germ the right bacteria, the right virus in the right places there, they'll, they're out. We become the superpower. We get to call the shots. We get to tell Israel what to do. We get to rule the world. Is it plausible? Is it possible? And again, like I started with this, we can debate this. We can, you don't have to agree with what I'm saying. I'm just giving you some scenarios, some things to think about. There's two more scenarios, but I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop, and I'm going to give them to you next week. Okay? I'm stopping there because I know some of you are thinking, <laughs> Boy, preacher, I'm glad I came to church today. I feel so uplifted I'm feeling so warm in my heart today. This was such a good, reassuring message. That was not my intent. But as your pastor, I have to tell you the truth. There's two more scenarios. Folks, the fourth one ain't so bad. Come back next week, bring a friend with you. And I'll let you in. But church, let me finish with this thought right here. Okay? I want to tell you something that you and I as Christians don't think about a whole lot. Regardless of what happens to our nation, we're on the winning team. We win. I have read Stephanie all the way to the end. <laughs> We win. This, listen, as much as I love my home, as much as I love Western North Carolina, as much as I love America, this is not my house. This is not my home. This is, to quote a song, this is not where I belong. I'm just passing through. See, we get in trouble when we stake our whole lives, our whole existence on what we have here and we neglect 
watched come. Tammy and I built the house that we live in in 1991. And we do not have a mansion, but God has blessed us with a very nice home. Very nice. We hired the contractor to build it. It took him about nine months of meticulous building and putting together and construction to put this thing together. <laughs> nine months. It's, it's pretty awesome. The Bible says that my Savior has been preparing a place for me for 2,000 years. Wait till you see my new house, folks. Wait till you see my real home. The Bible says it's in a gated community. There's a crystal sea beside it. The streets are paved in gold. I live on a dirt road now, Greg. I'm stepping up. This is not my home. This is not your home. You have a home coming. People are there. They're waiting on us. I love my country and I hate to see anything bad happen to it. But sometimes, folks, you have to let it go. Focus on what you got coming. Now, I'm not telling you to give up on America. Please, don't, don't think I'm... We need to pray for our country. We need to be proud of our country. We need to take care of our country. But we have to realize this is temporary. That's permanent. That's eternal. That's forever. Here's my question to you. Have you made a deal with the building contractor in heaven? To have your new home built. Because if you haven't. You need to walk down this aisle in a minute. And get down on your hands and knees. And ask God to forgive you of your sins. To come into your heart and be your savior. So you can inherit what your father has for you. Is that making sense? Bam come on down. Everybody stand to your feet. The band's going to play a song. And because of social distancing, I can't stand down here and pray with people. I'm not supposed to do that. But there's nothing stopping you from coming down to this, this whole stage as an altar. You come down here and you pour your heart out to God. You pray for your nation. Maybe you've got something happening in your life today that has nothing to do with what I've talked about. Maybe, maybe you're just hurting in your heart and you need to come to God. Would you please come down and pray this morning? Lord, Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Father, that you are on the throne and you are in control. Even when it seems like everything is falling apart around us, Lord, Father, you've got us. Lord, I pray right now that you'd bind Satan, take him out of this place, and let your Holy Spirit flow freely, Lord, Father. Let people move as they feel led to move. Bless us, Father. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Praise band, good to have you back. Good to have you back. Good to have you here today. Listen, listen. Don't leave here down and out. That was not my intention today. There is hope. We'll talk about it next week. Bring somebody so they can hear some hope. Before we leave, I need to do something. Have y'all got just a minute? I need to do something. Somebody wants to do something special. And I'm going to go, I'm going to do something I've never done before, Brenda. I'm going to go to them instead of making them come to me with social distancing and all that. It's going to require you to watch me walk. Watch me walk. Watch this. Come here. Come here. I'm serious. Y'all got to, y'all got to watch me. You got to watch me. There's two people standing here whom I love very much. Steve and Melissa Stepp. They've been coming to the church. They've fallen in love with you people. I have no idea why, <laughs> but they have. And they want to become part of your church family. They want to join your church. So I ask you, what is the privilege of the church today? It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, please raise your hand and raise it high. Brenda, is that every, that's every hand in here. I believe it's unanimous. I'm not even going to ask for an opposing vote. Steve, Melissa, thank you. We love you. Thank you for being part of our family. As you pass by, don't hug on them like we normally do, but please tell them how much you love them and appreciate them and you're glad you're part of their family. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim, would somebody give Tim a mic? Let him close us in a word of prayer. Love y'all. Thank you.